I was talking to a, a General Electric uh, executive by the name of Stefan Brungard, who pointed out that um, General Electric diesel locomotives collect 9 million points of data every second. Anybody in the diesel locomotive business? Probably not. 9 million points of data every second. So I asked him, how, ma how much of that data actually gets used? And he said, three. And I, <laughs> I said, well, see, so you already got it. I said, three million? He said, no, 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 three. <laughs> so, uh, so um, I, it's, it's not just a problem in the manufacturing space. So um, in 1995, uh, this guy, you may have heard of him, um, William Gates III, uh, he said, uh, why would I have an internet division? Because, um, uh, you know, it'd be like having an electric division. You know, I, I thought about that in 1995 because Procter & Gamble at the, at the beginning of the century, uh, I'm sorry, not this century, the previous one, um, dating myself, uh, um, uh, did have an electric division. And the purpose of that division was to figure out how to use this new technology, apply this new technology to their manufacturing, to their, uh, to their wholesaling, to their distribution channels, to their transportation logistics, and so forth. Um, and, and yes, in 1999, uh, Gates changed his tune, and he wrote a letter to all of his employees, which is how they get management control at Microsoft. Um, okay, nobody thought that was funny. Um, <laughs> He wrote a letter saying this, a fundamental new rule for business is that the internet changes everything. Who agrees with that? This is a billionaire. You've got to agree with him. One guy in the back who's mostly reading his email gets, agrees with that. Everybody else, everybody else disagrees, right? Anybody disagree with it? Anybody still awake? I got one hand, two hands total for okay, two questions. So excellent for out of 250 people. I, I think we can name some markets where the internet has changed everything, and, and here are a few. Upper left-hand corner, that's how we used to listen to music. For those of you who still have all your hair, that's called a boombox. What's so funny? I've been cutting my hair off, actually, so to, to appear more distinguished. It hasn't really worked yet. Um, uh, and uh, actually, vinyl's coming back, so records are coming back, believe it or not, um, because they sound worse and people like that or something like that. Um, the way we listen to music has changed completely, right? We listen to music on computers. Uh, whether those are desktops or laptops or more likely um, small music players or, this is a Blackberry, by the way. I'll, I'll be happy to explain to anybody what that is. Um, by the way, I gave this talk two weeks ago in Ottawa and I, I made the same joke and nobody got it. And then I realized later <laughs> the whole room was full of Blackberries. But, um, that call, talk about nationalism. So that's 30 million customers. Um, the way we listen to music is now on computers, whether those computers are tiny or not. And by the way, the, the phone in my pocket has um, more computing power than all the computers at MIT when I arrived there in 1978. So um, there, 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 it is a supercomputer. Um, the way that we watch television uh, has changed completely. By the way, that thing on the left there is what, we, what a television used to look like for those of you who uh, who've never seen something that wasn't flat. Um, my kids are 24 and 26 years old. Um, neither one has cable service. Neither one watches television over the air. Nothing. They get everything they want over the internet. Just stop nodding. I don't care about you. I mean, it's, 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 like, it's like, why would you do anything else? Yeah. Don't allow 14-year-olds into the conference next year. <laughs> Um, there are plenty of other examples. Um, I, near the bottom there, the, um, that, that big paper thing the guy's holding, that's called a newspaper. Um, and that's how people used to get their news. Actually, even I no longer get a city newspaper, the Boston Glob Globe. Um, 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 and there are many reasons for that. One is the reading level has dropped below uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> I read, I read news, of course, every single day, many times a day, but I read it on the web, as most of you do. I do, however, still get the town paper, the Lexington Minuteman, because I need to know, you know when, when trees in the middle of town have been hit by lightning. That was a front, front page photograph, by the way, a tree on the common hit by lightning. I love those kind of newspapers. So yes, I mean, there are, there are plenty of examples where the internet has changed everything, has disintermediated. By the way, that was bull. It never disintermediated anything. It reintermediated, right? We just put a new intermediary in between us and uh, uh, and and the, the the services and products that we're that we're buying, whether that's Amazon or or, or any other or any other source. Um, I, I like that quote, and I never can remember who said it. You know, Uber owns no cars, uh, Airbnb owns no real estate, and you, there are many many of these examples. They are the new intermediaries. But I'm here to tell you that there are a lot of markets that have not been changed, have hardly been affected, and this would be the one that you guys care the most about. 
Um, anybody recognize that device? 1980, it's a little, yeah. <laughs> you've seen it in a museum, right? Tell the truth, yeah, okay. Um, so in, in 1980, I led a team at a, 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 an artificial intelligence company, back when artificial intelligence was still possible, and now it is again. In the meantime, it was impossible. Um, uh, that um, um, replaced the three, uh, the three experts that knew how to diagnose a failed Modicon 584 programmable controller, PLC, um, with an expert system that could do better than they did. Um, our customer was a different GM, um, General Motors, and a, uh, we called them Generous Motors because they had a lot of money in those days. Um, and um, uh, what, what it did was it, it basically step by step um, went through uh, um, an expert system rules, rule-based rule system to figure out what was wrong with the brake lining factory that GM was running. Um, so uh, I'm sure you recognize the diagram to the right of that uh, Modicon 584. Um, that's called a ladder diagram. Um, very, very different from every other programming language that existed at the time. And, and to Jim's point, there was this huge separation between operational systems and information systems. And if you wanted to be able to program them both, you had to learn two completely different ways of thinking about how programming worked. And if you wanted to connect them so that you could get information from the PLCs to your uh, information systems to know what was coming through the factory floor, make it more efficient, make sure people were working on the right things, you know, just-in-time deliveries and so forth, you could print out that data and type it back into an information system. Uh, um, that, that was a manufacturing resource planning system, for those of you who remember that term. Things have completely changed, and those are now called enterprise resource planning systems. Um, so that's the Modicon 584. As you know, the company's been bought and sold many times. It's now owned by a French company headquartered in Rhode Island with a German name. Um, and for those of you who don't know, that would be Schneider Automation. Um, here we are 35 years later, later, and the box is completely different. Actually, the guts are almost entirely the same. It's still Motorola 68000 based, um, although a different kind of 68000. The box is now made of plastic, I think. Uh, the programming model is the same, and the way that you connect it, as uh, the gentleman over here asked, um, is a mess, right? You've got thousands of different field buses, um, even though they all may use the same physical transport layer, Ethernet. Um, everything that connects the two is, is completely different, and worse, completely different than all our information systems. So th something didn't happen, and that what didn't happen was internet thinking. Nobody was thinking, we've got this technology, the internet, that changes everything, and we ought to apply it to all our systems. Um, and, and that, excuse me, I have to have a conversation back here. Um, that's, that didn't change. Even though the internet clearly was changing things in 1980, there were very few of us that knew it. In 1980, I had a business card with my email address on it, which everybody thought was bizarre, um, and I thought was really cool. Now it's not particularly cool. Um, in 1978, by the way, there was a published list of all of the computers on the ARPANET, the, the internet of the time. Um, I'm, I'm in that list, so it's a it's kind of exciting little piece of memorabilia to me, because I don't think you could print that anymore. I'm here to tell you, however, that there are other markets that have had exactly the same situation. So here's an example. In 1950, power systems, uh, electric grids, anybody in the electric grid space? Nobody, so I can lie. Um, uh, in, in 1950, there was the assumption that there were a small number of power generators and tens of millions or hundreds of millions of power users. In the United States in 1950, there were three power grids, East, West, and Texas. Everybody thinks that's funny, but it's actually a simple fact. <laughs> um, and um, by the way, here we are 65 years later and nothing has changed. Our grids still look the same. I have a little story that goes with this. I was invited a few years ago to give a talk at a, a meeting of a bunch of power grid manufacturers and maintainers uh, and, and operators. And the reason I was invited is because they had a data communications problem, they said. They wanted to change the grids. So right, right now, the grids uh, are, are managed in such a way that you never, over, you never put too much power through any major transmission line. Um, obviously, if you do, then things go bad, like the transmission lines melt. Um, so you take the maximum temperature at the location of each transmission line, you add 10 Celsius degrees, you figure out what, based on the resistance of the cable, how much juice you can put through the cable. You never put more than that through, ever. Simple idea. They had this really clever idea that they were going to put these super important things on those cables. They're called um, thermometers. 
and, and um, report back to a central management location what the actual temperature is now on the cable. And then you might be able to put more power through, and you might, be, I might not have to shed power, that is, turn off cities and neighborhoods, as often as we do today. But they said the transmission requirements were enormous. So I said, well, here's an envelope. I'll turn it over to the back. Here's a pencil. Let's, let's do the calculation. How many thermometers? Nationwide, 200. I said, OK, let's round up 256. <laughs> Nobody got the joke, by the way, which, which should have told me something. And, and how often do you have to sample it? They said, well, once a second is enough. As you all know, 86,400 seconds in a day. Everybody's going, 60 times 60, yeah. it's 86,400. OK. Um, and how big is the sample size? It's a byte, right? It's a temperature. So one byte's enough. OK, that comes out to two megabytes a day. Um, and I said, well, I don't understand. What is the problem? Well, we can't transmit anything on the, on the power grids because they've got essentially big capacitors to make sure no information passes on the grids. So um, you know, how are we going to get that kind of enormous bandwidth? And I said, it's two megabytes a day. And they all said, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the problem. And I, and I said, you know, in my house, I have two megabytes a second. Um, and I swear to God, one of them said, oh my God, you're right. So do I. The important point there is, these are not stupid people. These are people that keep our electric grids up and running nationwide. That's not an easy thing. They're old and creaky. Uh, not the people, the, the grids. Um, actually, some of the people, anyway. Um, I told you the jokes would get worse. <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, they, they just didn't connect internet thinking to operational thinking. They've, uh, they've been so separate for so long that they haven't connected. I'll give you one more example. This is the core of a jet engine. Um, jet engines, I don't know how many of you realize, but they collect performance data every second that they're in flight. And for decades they've done this. They've, in the early 60s, actually, was when the first uh, jet engine started collecting performance metrics. And uh, um, uh, one of the larger jet engines, like a GE90 on the wing of a 777, um, will land with up to 10 terabytes of data after a long flight. Um, so you'd expect that then um, that when the plane would pull up to the gate and um, uh, it would connect to the Wi-Fi at the airport, um, upload all the performance data, it would then go to the manufacturer of the jet engine, whether that's AVIC or COMAC or GE or Pratt & Whitney or CFM or whomever. And they would just do benchmarking, real-time predictive analytics against that, send a message back to the maintenance base and say, you know, you'll get a little bit more efficiency, 1% more efficiency if you change uh, blade three on the second stage compressor. Or th this engine looks like an engine that failed last year in the same situation. No, actually, what really happens is the jet lands. <clears throat> and if there's time, and if it's a low-cost carrier, there isn't time. It's only on the, on the ground for 25 minutes. A maintenance person will stick a cable up into the jet, download the data. Maybe at the end of the day, he or she will have the time to look at that data and say, oh, something looks hinky. I better upload it to the manufacturer. And maybe at the end of the week or the end of the month, the manufacturer will do a batch run against that data and say, oh, dear, I think we better go find N5263 because it's about to fall out of the sky. Fortunately, jet engines are tremendously, tremendously um, not only efficient, but, uh, uh, but amazingly stable. Jet engines don't fail anymore. And just remember that when you're on one of those trans-Pacific two-engine flights. <clears throat> there are lots of other examples. I'm not going to bore you with a bunch of other examples. There are some pretty exciting ones if you're ever interested or you can ask during the Q&A. An oil and gas, for example, where, uh, uh, where uh, you've got oil and gas platforms out um, in the middle of the water and they need to make decisions every tenth of a second about the drilling mud and the drill head and whether to pull it up or push it down and increase the pressure, decrease the pressure, and so forth. Um, but they need to do most of the compute for that um, in their data centers, which are onshore. Uh, and they use, um, they use satellite communications. Um, uh, they use uh, geosynchronous satellite uh, communications in order to, uh, in order to connect their, in, in their systems in the water with the systems onshore. Um, and they're mostly complaining that, well, so a geosynchronous round trip is about a second. It's hard to make a decision every tenth of a second if the resolution of your, of your communications is only once a second. Um, so they're asking for faster than light communication, no problem. Um, it's, like that, it's like that speed limit sign that you saw on the way here, right? It's 186,282 miles per second. It's not just a good idea, it's the law. <laughs> Rail, I mean, I've already talked about transportation a little bit, so I won't, I won't say more about that. What's really missing is internet thinking. 
a tremendous gulf between the operational systems and information systems, just as Jim was talking about. Uh, and that's, that's something that is pervasive throughout industrial systems. And in fact, there are enormous opportunities there. Let's look about what those opportunities have done in the past. So in the late 19th century, there was this revolution that replaced human brawn with machines. For those of you who were asleep during uh, seventh grade uh, history, that was called the Industrial Revolution. Um, and the Industrial Revolution, by the way, featured a, a group of people called the Luddites. Anybody heard of the Luddites? Anybody in here a Luddite? Actually, Jim's point about um, organizations being slow to change is proof to me that just about everybody is a Luddite. And being a Luddite is not a terrible idea. Um, and one of the ways we get efficiency is by doing things the way we always do things. Um, and if you haven't read Thomas Kuhn's Structure of uh, Scientific Revolution, it's definitely worth reading. Lots of people talk about it. Nobody's read it. Um, so late 19th century, we have this change, the Industrial Revolution. We have enormous social disruption. Don't forget that. I'm going to come back to it later. But we also have a huge productivity increase, right? Something like uh, four times productivity increase. Because machines are doing a lot of the, uh, a lot of the things that human beings were doing before, or, or worse, horses were doing before. Late 20th century, we have this other revolution, the internet revolution, replacing human communications with machine communications, primarily human compute with machine compute on a very wide basis, and ends up with smartphones in all our pockets. Um, again, an enormous leap in productivity, a bunch of people that got very, very rich and don't realize they were just incredibly lucky. Don't tell them I said that. Um, and, and, um, uh, and again, social disruption. Um, so for example, um, yeah, Uber is seriously disrupting, whether that's creative disruption, I'm sorry, constructive disruption or some other kind of disruption, Uber is tremendously disrupting the taxi cab and limousine industry. Airbnb is, is tremendously disrupting the, uh, uh, the, the hotel industry, for example. Um, and I think there's an opportunity to combine those two with what we, what internet, add internet thinking to industrial systems into what we call the industrial internet. And I think that we're going to see a huge leap in, in productivity from that as well. What we're looking for is transformational change. Um, and as, as Jim pointed out very well, and as a uh, gentleman over there asked about, um, there, that is really, really hard. And it's really about leadership. It's about trying things out um, much more than it is about the technology. The technology has been around forever. I'll talk about that in one slide later on. But the technology has not really changed all that much in the last couple of years. What's happened is a confluence of price decreases, really. You'll notice I've only been talking about industrial internet, that is, applying internet technologies to uh, industrial systems. Obviously, there's a huge opportunity still in the consumer space. Many of you are wearing Fitbits, which you studiously ignore because you don't really want to know how little you walked yesterday. I see a couple of smiles in the audience. Um, I, I solve that problem by not wearing a Fitbit. Um, um, and, and there's shopping carts and self-driving cars and so forth. I actually think self-driving cars are not particularly um, they're, they're just they're consumer technology. Where, where things get interesting is when self-driving cars talk to each other, as in uh, page one of the Wall Street Journal this morning, or when self-driving cars actually talk to the roadbed, and the roadbed said, hey, there, says, there's, hey, there's an accident 10 kilometers up ahead. There are seven detours. Take the third one. That's the one that's least, uh, least full today. We're focusing on the, on the left side there, the industrial applications, um, and, that, and partially because that's where the margins are but also partially because the requirements are a little different. The requirements for robustness and, and security are a little bit different, which is also why you have slower uptake in the industrial space. But there's an opportunity here, and it's not a small opportunity. Now, I'm going to quote a bunch of numbers. Um, I don't believe any of them, uh, but it's good to, it's good to get your, 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 your potential market sizes from a, different, a bunch of different sources. My particular favorite was published about four years ago by the um, uh, chief economist of General Electric, a gentleman by the name of Marco Annunziata. Um, he did an analysis of world GDP, which at that time was about 70 trillion US dollars, and said that 46% of it um, could be addressed and made more efficient with Internet of, Internet of Things technology applied to industrial systems. That's a $32.3 trillion opportunity. Uh, sorry, did I say 47%? It's 46%. I was only off by you know, $3 trillion. Um, things happen. Um, that's an interesting market size. Um, there are a bunch of things that a bunch of people agree with them. Cisco calls it a 21% uh, increase in profits and $19 trillion to the global bottom line by 2020. 
Gardner says uh, uh, 300 billion. That's actually the same number as a 1% uh, increase in efficiency from the General Electric number. So 300 billion by 2020. Um, and McKinsey, um, which is always right, I know because they're expensive. Um, no, anybody from McKinsey in here? <laughs> That's all right. He already pissed off all the Microsoft people, so it was my turn. Um, uh, McKinsey says $36 trillion operating costs uh, affected. The, the point is, whether you call it Internet of Things or Industry 4.0, Industry 4.0, or whether you call it cyber physical systems, which our, our uh, federal government insists on calling it, um, or, uh, uh, or any of the other names, Cisco's name is Internet of Everything, it's all about the same thing, and that is collecting information from a large number of sensors, potentially planet-wide, potentially hundreds of millions of sensors, doing real-time predictive analytics, typically comparing to benchmarks, and then supplying that information in a way that's actually digestible by human beings, or ignoring human beings completely and going straight through to the actuators that are also connected to the network. That's it. That's the pattern. It's a very simple idea. And none of those technologies is particularly new. The idea of applying that technology to industrial systems, however, is a damn good idea. Where's the revenue, all that great new revenue going to come from? Trillions of dollars of revenue? Well, I think most importantly, it's uh, revolutionary new products and services. And I'll tell you what those new products and services are going to be. I don't know. Or was that delivered too fast? OK, sorry. Um, I, I do know what some of them are going to be. I, um, actually, uh, Industry 4.0 in Germany um, uh, just published a, uh, a paper called Smart Services Welt, Smart Services World, which is actually quite good and points out that there's an enormous transition ha and transition already happening in our, in our economy, the world economy, um, caused by the move from CapEx to OpEx. Um, so my favorite example, because I'm an airplane nut, I really love being in the flight path, uh, although it made me stay up all night watching planes come in. Look, a DC-9 um, is um, the, the change in the way jet engines are sold. So for decades, you wanted a jet engine. You went to the jet engine manufacturer, Rolls-Royce, General Electric, uh, CFM, whomever, Pratt & Whitney, and said, I want a jet engine. They would sell you the jet engine for about 80% of their cost. And then over the next 20 to 40 years, they would sell you spare parts, typically five times the cost of the engine, um, to, to fix that engine, to maintain that engine, to keep the efficiency of that engine. If you go to General Electric today and say, I need a jet engine, um, and um, uh, I'm, go I'm going to need it for the next 20 years on my, seven, uh, my Boeing 737, they'll say, well, we'll sell it to you the same way we always did. But if you prefer, we'll rent it to you. And we'll rent it to you uh, for a certain number of hundreds of thousands of pounds of propulsion over a certain number of hours. And we will guarantee that it will not use more than a certain amount of fuel. It's propulsion as a service. Nobody thought that was funny. OK, sorry. Um, that's really interesting, right? If it uses more fuel than their promise, then they will pay for the extra fuel. More than that, over the life of the lease, GE these days is promising that the amount of fuel used will drop by 1% a year. The, the guarantee, the fuel use guarantee will drop by 1% a year. That's really interesting. And the way they can do that is they now have a direct connection from the manufacturer all the way through to the device. Used to be you sold a device to a distributor. Distributor sells it to a wholesaler. Wholesaler sells it to a retailer. Retailer sells it to a consumer. And the manufacturer no longer has any information about how that device is being used. They don't know what their customers are doing with it, their end customers. They don't know uh, the efficiency of those devices. They, don't, they, they can't actually make those devices more efficient. But when they're leasing you the device, they have to maintain it. And they, have, they get that data every minute of every day so they can make sure that it meets those performance guarantees. That's a big change. It's a big change in the way things are serviced. It's a big change in the way things are sold or leased. And it's a big change in the bottom line of the airlines, which are just going to lose money anyway. Anybody in the airline business? <laughs> Thank goodness. Um, so first of all, huge new changes in, in business models. New operational efficiencies are driving those business models. And I think the most important is the bottom one, which Jim also mentioned, and that is improved customer satisfaction because the products no longer fail. Or if they are going to fail, you know it ahead of time, and you get the, de you get the part that you, that you require to fix the device and make sure that it keeps on running. That's a huge change. 
And it's a change in the manufacturing space. It's a change in electrical power uh, generation, distribution, and transmission. It's a change in even financial services. For example, if I could sample all of the trades happening on every exchange in the world simultaneously, I could do benchmarking against, I don't know, November 1929, October 1987, September 2008, and say, this looks like the market in those days looked, and we're about to suffer a crash. And then you know, the bankers could say, well, so what? OK, that's not funny at all. Um, the opportunities, uh, this is again from uh, uh, Annunciata's report from General Electric. It's now uh, at two or three years old, uh, four years old, I think, actually. They said a 15-year outlook for savings on just General Electric products, $2 billion a year in fuel savings for General Electric jet engines. I know $2 billion doesn't buy what it used to, but it, it will buy a couple of you know, Central American countries. Um, $66 billion in diesel engines, so that, you thought that was funny? <laughs> I got friends in Central America coming after you. Um, uh, $66 billion in diesel engines. Um, there are some interesting other statistics there. 68% decrease uh, in, uh, in crime in places where um, uh, shoulder cams are put on the, the shoulder of every policeman in the district. I don't know if that's because there's a decrease in, uh, because of the criminals don't want to be caught on camera or Okay, I'm stopping there. I, I forgot I was in Chicago. Um, <clears throat> upper right-hand corner is actually my favorite. $63 billion in savings and liability that comes from uh, um, health care failures. I'm going to talk about one of those at the end of the talk. Um, but uh, I'm excited by that because it's not just about decrease in cost, but also saving lives. So how do we get there? And, and here I'm going to replicate some of the things that Jim said. We could hope that the connectivity providers and the technology providers and the manufacturers and the airlines and the banks and everybody would just get together one-on-one -on -one and make this happen. But it's unlikely to happen. Um, we actually have to collaborate. And that's what the Industrial Internet Consortium does. Uh, we bring together technology providers, manufacturers, uh, banks, insurance companies, um, uh, research organizations, universities, government agencies to figure out what actually works and what doesn't work. How do we do that? Do we just go build standards? Well, having been in the standards world myself for some 35 years, I'd love to say yes. But the reality is you've got to try it first and see what you need, what standards need to be created. It doesn't make sense to build standards and hope you can figure out how you use them. That's how we end up with 1,000 field buses. It makes more sense to go build it uh, and, uh, and, and see what works and what doesn't work. I call it the Nike effect, which is about you know, hiring 12-year-olds in Indonesia. No, no, it's about uh, just do it. Just do it. Try it out. We call it test beds. You can call it demonstration projects or pilots. We don't really care what you call it. Here's our mission. It's shorter than the SMLC's mission. I'm not going to read it to you because the only important words are the last three words, transformational business outcomes. We're not focused on technology. We're focused on how do we get transformational business outcomes? How do we figure out where the disruptive new products and services are? Secondarily, not even in the mission, what standards would have made it easier to build our test beds? And then tell the standards organizations that. So this organization was founded on March 27, 2014. So we're uh, just about 13 and a half months old. Um, we uh, were founded by AT&T, Cisco, General Electric, IBM, and Intel. Carefully, they're in alphabetical order so that they'll get angry at me anyway. Um, and um, uh, we expect it to be at about 50 to 60 members by today. But in fact, today we're about 170 members. So there's we obviously has struck a chord with people. Um, besides the, the five founders, you see a lot of other technology uh, providers, everything from uh, device providers like analog devices to software providers, uh, storage providers like EMC and software and, and hardware providers like Samsung. But you also see mining companies, upper left-hand corner, Codelco. Anybody ever heard of Codelco? Chile, copper, yes, exactly. I like your accent. <laughs> Usted de Chile? No. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, we had a private conversation. Sorry. Um, Codelco is the largest copper miner in the world. From one mine in northern Chile, a mine by the name of Chuquicamata, they mine 35 percent of the world's copper 24 hours a day. And when mining stops, the price of copper on the world markets go, uh, goes up. That tells you something about the importance of this company that most of you have never heard of. And copper, by the way, turns out to be kind of important for things like um, electricity. Um, 
By the way, the whole building, their headquarters building, is, is, is all made of copper. It's quite interesting to see. But my point is, there's all sorts of things that you can do to make sure that that mine doesn't stop. There's all sorts of things that you can do to make sure that that mine is safe for the miners that are underground. Um, they wanted to build a network to uh, integrate safety devices around the mine, but the mine is a copper mine. So for those of you who are not familiar with the concept of a Faraday cage, that's impossible. So they're doing other clever things, and we're building a test bed with them. Um, there are also a very large number of small companies participating, so it's not just the large companies that were on the previous slide. Small companies in the manufacturing space, in the, in the healthcare space, um, but also technology providers who bring a lot of innovation to the table. Um, and um, about a couple of dozen uh, research organizations and universities because they bring information about what can be done, can't be done, has been done, uh, what should be studied, um, and from all over the world. Although we started with five companies um, that were all headquartered in the U.S., we're about uh, two-thirds U.S. Uh, headquartered now and falling rapidly. So it is a worldwide organization. I'll tell you about the test beds, that, uh, some of the test beds that we're currently running. Um, we have a, a test bed development group that <coughs> has, about a, has about a dozen, 15 test bed uh, or prototype uh, processes underway. Six of those has been, have been approved by our board of directors. Two of them are public, and I can talk about them, so I will. First one's a manufacturing test bed. Uh, led by Bosch and Tech Mahindra with the support of Cisco, the track and trace test bed is simply about knowing what is where on the factory floor. Um, so I know that uh, Bosch Rexroth um, is uh, one of the sponsors of this uh, conference. I don't know if they're talking about the test bed, but if you see somebody from Bosch, bother him. It's, just, it's really, fun to, really fun to look at. And um, a very simple idea. If you know where everything is on the factory floor, the people, the tools, the parts, and the, uh, and the, and the, and the uh, uh, inventory that's being worked on, then you can make that factory floor more efficient and more safe. They actually did a demonstration at Bosch Connected World uh, three months ago where a, a Bosch employee playing a factory, uh, factory worker uh, was on stage um, and picked up a bolt to put it into an electric motor, and uh, the system uh, immediately woke him up. It would have been on Google Glasses, but for the audience, it was up on a screen, said, that's the wrong part. Please put it back in bin one. Pick, take a part from bin two. It goes into this hole on the, on the electric motor, and you need to use that tool. Oh, you haven't been trained on that tool, so it gave him training on the tool on the spot. Um, and, and so forth. Um, you, I mean, you can see what sorts of efficiencies you can get if you're more intelligent about where things are on the factory floor. The technology they used for phase one of this process, by the way, only gave them about one meter resolution of location, indoor location. Um, for the next uh, revision, uh, phase two of this process, they're looking for technology now uh, to, um, to get that down to three millimeters so they know exactly which hole you're putting the bolt uh, into, into the device. Uh, unfortunately, there is no such technology today, so they're going to have to develop it. And they're actually today talking to some people at MIT who have some clever ideas about how to make that happen. You can see the, the features on the list here, asset management, integration, improved safety and operational performance, and being able to monitor, monitor and control quality. I often get asked at this point um, of the, uh, the results of this test bed, who owns them. Um, we leave that up to the testbed developers, but in this case, the testbed developers who were joined by National Instruments, so it's the four companies, National Instruments, Cisco, and then the leaders, uh, Bosch and Tech Mahindra, have not only open sourced all of the software that they developed for this, uh, for this prototype, um, but they're also bringing the results to the Object Management Group for standardization of device management. Completely open, about as open as you could possibly be. And we are talking to SMLC about how we can do something together with that. The other test bed I can talk about is uh, the, our communication and control test bed. Yes, we only choose alliterative names for our test beds. TNT, now CNC. Uh, we have 24 left. I just thought of that one, but it's not really funny. Um, um, the idea of this one, which is led by RTI and National Instruments, again with the support of Cisco, is um, to build smarter grids. Uh, and in particular, they're, they're building a proof of concept right now at National Instruments in, in Austin. Um, the problem in the grid world is uh, integration of uh, power sources that are not as constant as nuclear, coal, and gas. For example, aeolic or wind energy and, uh, and, and solar energy. Solar energy typically only works when people have light bulbs held up against the solar panels or if the sun is out. Um, so obviously, you, you don't have that consistency. You need to be able to store excess energy. You need to be able to pull excess energy from other grids uh, in order to keep uh, neighborhoods humming. 
Um, they're building a test cell right now. If that works, they're going to build a larger test at, with Southern California Edison in Southern California. And uh, phase three planned for the end of the year is to actually replace the running power grids of San Antonio, Texas with a group of microgrids that share power uh, among them uh, and with other uh, batteries on, uh, in the city, for example, the battery sitting in the back of hybrid and electric cars, moving power around as necessary so nobody ever gets shed. That's the power word for blacked out. Um, and so there's no, no, never any excess energy that they have to just get rid of. Um, so I, I know this isn't uh, right in the center for a lot of you, but uh, it's interesting that a lot of the same technologies that work in the manufacturing space are just as important in the power grid space. I promised you one slide on technology. This is the one slide on technology. Why now? I said this technology isn't particularly new. Um, having come from an academic background in the early 12th century, she thinks everything I say is funny, by the way. I have to tell you, she's fantastic. Yeah, just two things. OK, fine. Um, um, I, I, it, it was amazing to me to come out, as many of you did, into, into, the, into the working world and find that the technology was 20, 30 years behind what we were doing in academia. Um, so I, it, it's not surprising to say a lot of this technology has been around forever. Um, what's really happened over the last couple of years is a convergence between really low cost um, uh, processing power, near zero cost processing power that we can put everywhere, um, very cheap sensors and actuators. So the devices cost nearly nothing, and the prices are still dropping. With the, with the introduction of MEMS technology, you can put devices on chip at, at nearly no cost. It's like the change from lasers. When I was working with lasers in 1979, um, they were big and they were expensive. Now lasers are small and sit on top of semiconductors. So you can put dozens of them on a chip at no cost. Also, the fact that everything's connected. Um, and by the way, I'd like to point out that I kept that for very late in the presentation. Too many of these talks start with, there are, seven, there are going to be 70 billion things connected to the internet. Who cares? What's interesting is what can I do with them? But the fact that, that we do have connectivity ubiquitous um, is, is really important. And the fact that we've got smarter machines. In fact, I think of it as smarter manufacturing in just the sense that Jim was using, smart machines that those manufacturing systems are, use, the smart devices that they manufacture. That is, where the devices are connected to the internet themselves um, and, and have uh, IT in them, you might think. And at the back end, you also have smart data. That is, we, have, we know much more about how the products are used, and that data is available all the way back up to the manufacturer. Imagine how that changes the way you interact with your end customers as opposed to your distributors. So what's the future other than slides with horrible builds? Uh, I'd like to talk about the one on the, the right-hand side there. Anybody recognize that device? Um, if, you've ever, if you've ever had surgery um, and um, uh, you've seen that device, or you've at least felt it, it sits on your finger, um, and it guesses how much oxygen is in your blood. And I say guesses, I, re I really mean guesses. 20% of its readings are wrong, known to be true. Uh, the reason for that is it turns out we have different colors of skin. We have different thicknesses of arterial walls. Um, so it's really only guessing. And by the way, it's guessing at a pretty important number, because um, if your oxygen level falls below a certain level for more than four minutes, you no longer have to worry about anything ever again. <laughs> it's called an O2 sensor, oxygen sensor. It has a bunch of other more complicated names, but only doctors and lawyers can say those, because they're in Latin. 20% failure rate. How can we depend on devices that have a 20% failure rate? Well, Jim talked about bad data coming from the factory floor. This is not constrained to factory floors. This is medical devices, too. Unfortunately, ICU nurses, intensive care unit nurses, know that uh, O2 sensors have a 20% failure rate. So if they get a warning from an O2 sensor, they'll probably ignore the first one, maybe the second one. Not because they're lazy, but because they've got 65 patients in the ICU, and they have to make sure they're only focusing on the ones that need immediate, la immediate help. Right, so that's possibly bad, by the way, right? If, if, uh, this despite the fact that we know that if your oxygen level is falling and your respiration is falling at the same time, you're in trouble. Better get a crash card in there right now. So obviously all we need to do is integrate O2 sensors and respiration sensors, right? You know how many are integrated anywhere in the world today? Zero. Because there are no O2 sensors, and oxygen, uh, O2 sensors and respiration sensors that are on the same network and use the same protocol anywhere in the world. 
There are no O2 sensors and respiration sensors made by the same manufacturers today. They have exactly the same problem that we have in the manufacturing space, that too many buses, too many protocols. There's a lab in Cambridge, Massachusetts, run by Partners Healthcare, Massachusetts General Hospital, which has been trying to integrate, among other sensors, O2 sensors and respiration sensors for four years. And I mean, they've got the technology working. That's not the hard part. They've got to get it approved by ASTM for quality, and they've got to get it approved by, uh, as a medical device by, uh, by federal and state governments. It takes time. And in the meantime, there's this huge liability because people die. It's not funny. Um, there's, there's problems we can actually solve if we can get people not necessarily to use the same bus, but to integrate those buses. That, by the way, is a really important point. So from the standards perspective, I'm just going to mention, because I also run the object management group, standards organization. Way too often, an engineer looks at the 97 different ways to solve a problem and says, gee, I could simplify this by coming up with one solution that solves all the problems of those 97 other different ones. At the end of that wonderful piece of engineering, you have 98. That's how we ended up with seven different power connectors around the world. In each country, somebody said, well, I could do better than that. Um, and they, we ended up with yet another power connector around the world. But what's really cool about power connectors is I can go into any hardware store and buy an, a, a device which connects my power connector on my laptop and my electric razor, which uses the power connection that God intended. <laughs> well, in this case, God is. Thomas Alva Edison, but you get the idea, um, with the power connector that's on the wall. Um, and, um, and if I forget to, to, to bring it with me, then I can stop in any airport and buy the same thing for $20. Um, but my point is, I didn't have to design it. I didn't have to maintain it. If it breaks, I, it's my God-given right as an American to throw it away and buy a new one. I, what, I'm, what, what I'm looking for when I look at standards is adaptation. What lowers the cost of adaptation to connect those systems? We're never going to replace any of those 1,000 field buses. Or if we do, it's going to take a long, long time. Let's connect them together. And that's what we should be looking for, semantic integration between different systems. Because we're never going to get to the point where there's only one. And every time we try to get to the point where there's only one, we fail. And you only have to look at smartphones. Um, uh, I mean, not, and, and by the way, it's not just Apple and Google. As I said, I've got a BlackBerry. And its battery lasts longer than all of your batteries <laughs> put together. So uh, that's the world that we think uh, we're headed towards, a world in which um, uh, the jet engines actually have better performance day after day because they, upgrade their inf their inf they up upload their information automatically when they land at airports. Um, the jet engine manufacturer knows what's going on and can maintain that jet engine better than ever before because they, they built the engine. They know more about it than anyone else. They have benchmark data from thousands of those engines on thousands of aircraft um, and millions of hours of flight. We think that um, you can do a lot better job, for example, in, uh, in logistics. Um, I don't know if you realize this, but harvesters know far more about, uh, uh, about the farm than most farmers. Um, a, a John Deere harvester uh, actually keeps track of everything that's going on on the farm, every 10 by 10 centimeters, uses differential GPS to keep track of what's on the farm, how much water has fallen on the farm, how much, uh, how mu uh, how much, uh, um, how much seed was put down, how much growth we got last season, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they know a lot about um, what's going to be grown on the farm over the next year. On the other end, the wholesalers and retailers of food know exactly what people are going to be buying over the next year because they've got decades of experience. And in between, you've got a logistics system that doesn't integrate with either end. And the net result of that, by the way, if you've been reading the safety papers from the federal government, is that the amount of perishable food in the United States that actually perishes in route, anybody want to take a guess? You know the answers to everything. 33%. One third of all perishable food in the United States perishes en route from farm to table. That's a pretty high number. Um, on the other hand, Fix that problem, and you've got an interesting other problem, which is you need one-third less logistics. Um, when people ask me what's the first, uh, what's the first affected market, I, don't, I, I always answer, I don't know. But I do know one interesting one, and that is self-driving cars are going to do away with taxi drivers. If I can, uh, if I can uh, get a, a car anytime I want, it comes to where I am, takes me to where I'm going, and then I can forget about the car. Um, I don't need a taxi driver. So there's going to be social disruption, and we have to plan for social disruption, and we have to make sure that we are retraining for that social disruption. 
That's the small one, by the way. Average utilization of automobiles in the United States today is 6%. If that sounds low to you, do the numbers for yourself, for your own car, which is sitting in a parking lot somewhere right now. Um, or if it's not, well, I forgot we're in Chicago. It might be somewhere else. Um, um, 6%. Uh, my wife and I own two cars, um, and in a world of self-driving cars where I know I can get a car whenever I want within a minute, it's going to take me where I'm going, I probably will no longer own two cars. I might not own any car at all. Things are coming together. That's what we're doing, building test beds to see what works, find the disruptive new products and services, transform business, and, uh, and, and see where the new opportunities are.